the practical wisdom by which to know the golden mean. The neocons therefore believe it to be both necessary and possible for wise statesmen to find the golden mean between altruism and self-interest, duties and rights, regulation and competition, religion and science, socialism and capitalism. Norman Podhoretz, for instance, has argued that the neoconservative statesman should be able to figure out, quote, the precise point at which the incentive to work would be undermined by the availability of welfare benefits, or the point at which the redistribution of income would begin to erode economic growth, or the point at which egalitarianism would come into serious conflict with liberty. In the end, the neocon's strategy to accept the moral ends of liberal socialism but with the caveat that they can do a better job of delivering the services or that they can direct those services toward conservative ends is their, <clears throat> their particular political method. Now, at the core of my book is the claim that the political philosopher Leo Strauss was the most important influence on Irving Kristol's intellectual development. My book reveals for the first time the importance of Irving Kristol's 1952 review of Strauss's Persecution and the Art of Writing. And for me, this is the Rosetta Stone, in a sense, for understanding the deepest layer of neoconservative political philosophy. Strauss, according to Kristol, had, quote, accomplished nothing less than a revolution in intellectual history. And most of us will, figuratively speaking, have to go back to school to learn the wisdom of the past we thought we knew, close quote. This is the moment, I argue, when neoconservatism was born. Neoconservatism, in other words, in my view, was born philosophically, intellectually, in 1952. And what was it that Crystal learned from Leo Strauss? First, that there is an unbridgeable chasm between theory and practice, philosophy and the city, the wise few and the vulgar many. That is, that there is a radical disjunction between what Strauss called the realm of theoretical truth, that is, the realm inhabited by philosophers, and the realm of practical moral guidance, that is, the realm inhabited by non-philosophers. And what this meant for Strauss is that platonic idealism is compatible with Machiavellian realism. Two, the West, Strauss argued, is in a state of moral decline, as seen by the rise of philosophic and cultural nihilism. He identified the source of modern nihilism with enlightenment liberalism, that is, with the liberalism of John Locke and Thomas Jefferson. Strauss was a trenchant critic of modern rationalism and science, natural rights individualism, and laissez-faire capitalism, all of which, he argued, turned man away from a supranatural reality to nature, from faith to reason, from community to the individual, from duty to rights, from inequality to equality, from order to freedom, and from self-sacrifice to self-interest. The result is that man and society have become unhinged from the natural moral order and from the religious faith necessary to sustain moral and political unity. Three, platonic political philosophy for Strauss, is a necessary antidote to the maladies of modern rationalistic society. And for Strauss, classical natural right was defined by four principles. First, the political community is the primary unit of moral and political value, which means that the common good is the end of the regime and the coerced unity is the means to that end. Second, a truly just political order should mirror quote, the hierarchic order of man's natural constitution, which means that some men are more fit to rule than others. Third, that which is naturally right for any given society for Strauss is always changing depending on circumstances, which means that philosophic statesmen should not be hampered by conventional morality or the rule of law. And finally, Virtue and the public interest represent the end or the purpose of the city, which means that wise statesmen must use what Strauss called benevolent coercion in order to make their citizens virtuous. And the last big point that Crystal learned from Strauss was this. Platonic statesmen should ground the regime on certain ancestral pieties and political myths. And the cardinal virtue 
for the vulgar many is self-sacrifice. Now, Straussianized neoconservatism neo is defined by what ne uh, Irving Kristol called a new synthesis of ideas, a synthesis he characterized as classical realist in nature and in temperament. At the core of neoconservatism is a fundamental dualism that combines what Strauss called the way of Thrasymachus with the way of Socrates. Platonic natural right, that is the realm of theoretical truth, provides the ultimate standard of justice for neoconservative statesmen. Yet the messy day-to-day -day reality of politics means that conventional morality and sometimes even Machiavellian prudence, that is the realm of practical moral reasoning, are both necessary and salutary. Philosophically, Strauss thought it possible to advocate what he called sh the shrewd power politics of Machiavelli within a larger platonic framework that separates theory from practice. Thus, Crystal learned how to reconcile platonic idealism, the classical thesis, with Machiavellian prudence, the realist thesis, antithesis, to create the neoconservative synthesis. What then are the core principles of neoconservatism? And one of the things that I've tried to do in this book is to, is to present neoconservatism as a systematic, integrated, comprehensive political philosophy. It's more than just a persuasion or a mood. So first, I believe that the neoconservatives have a metaphysics. They take the political community, or what Irving Kristol called the collective self, as the primary unit of moral and political value. They accept Plato's premise that the polis or the nation is the only community adequate for the fulfillment of man's natural end, which they associate with what they variously call the public interest or the common good. The actual content of the public interest is whatever wise men say it is, which is precisely why it should never be defined. And the highest task of neoconservative statesmanship is to superimpose a kind of uh, ideological unity on the collective self in the name of this ever-shifting public interest. Two, the neoconservatives have a view of knowledge, or they have a view of the way the human mind works. Neoconservatives begin with the platonic assumption that ordinary people are irrational and must be guided by those who are rational. According to Irving Kristol, there are, quote, and listen to this carefully, there are different kinds of truth for different kinds of people. There are truths appropriate for children, truths appropriate for students, truths that are appropriate for educated adults, and the notion that there should be one set of truths available to everyone is a modern democratic fallacy." Close quote. The highest truth in Strauss and Crystal is restricted to the philosopher, while the common man is and must be limited to knowledge of a different sort, to myth, revelation, and custom. Neoconservatives believe the opinions of the nation must therefore be shaped by those who rule. To control ideas is to control public opinion, which is to control the regime as a whole. Ultimately, the vulgar, the vulgar many, must be ruled by faith and by faith's necessary ally, force. What about the, neo <clears throat> what about the neoconservative ethics? If you believe, as Straussianized neocons do, that there are different kinds of truth for different kinds of people, then you must believe that there are and must be different kinds of moral codes as well. Ordinary people need some form of conventional morality that is easily learned, followed, and transmitted from one generation to another. The vulgar many need piety and patriotism as the ordering myths by which to live. For the neocons, morality is conventional and pragmatic. Because they regard the nation as the primary unit of political value, and because they identify the public interest with the purpose of government, they regard moral good and virtue to be that which works, not for the individual, but for the nation. Morality is therefore defined as overcoming one's petty self-interest so as to sacrifice for the common good. And then there's the neoconservative politics. Central to the neoconservatives' philosophy of governance is the conceit that it is possible, in the words of Irving Kristol, for a small elite to, quote, to have an a priori knowledge of what constitutes happiness 
for other people, close quote. The highest purpose of neoconservative statesmanship is therefore to shape preferences, form habits, cultivate virtues and create the good society, a society that is known a priori to those men of superior philosophic wisdom. The neocons therefore advocate using government force to make good decisions for America's non-philosophers in order to nudge them in certain directions, that is, toward choosing a life of virtue and duty. As Strauss made clear in his most influential work, Natural Right in History, statesmen must learn to use what he called forcible constraint and benevolent coercion in order to keep down the selfish and base desires of ordinary men and women.